Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to be looking at the complete pathway for degradation of red blood cells and the degradation pathway for heme into its individual degradation products, which are excreted in the urine and the feces. Now the red blood cell is degraded by either the spleen or the liver via a specialized set of cells called the reticuloendothelial system, and both of these uh, tissue types have it. Really, the red blood cell is broken down into hemoglobin, and then the hemoglobin is broken down into its two components that we just talked about. The globin part is easy to deal with. That's protein, so this is degraded by proteases into individual amino acids, which are either metabolized for energy or recycled for other purposes. And you can see that that globin degradation occurs in both the spleen and the liver over here on the right. The more complicated part to deal with is the heme B. And the heme B is degraded initially by heme oxygenase. This is an enzyme that breaks down heme into biliverdin. You can see the chemical structure of that up here. And then also it releases the iron from the center. Notice in heme B we have that iron, and now it's been removed from what is now biliverdin. Now regardless of whether it's the spleen or the liver, this iron is either stored as ferritin or hemosiderin, or it's moved into the blood bound to a protein called transferrin, and this allows uh, the iron to be transported to different tissues of the body. So iron is either stored in the liver or spleen, or it's transported to other tissues. What's also interesting about this reaction is heme oxygenase releases one molecule of carbon monoxide. Uh, carbon monoxide is one of those molecules where in large amounts it'll kill you, right? Uh, but in small amounts that's naturally produced by this enzyme in the body, the carbon monoxide actually plays an important anti-inflammatory and vasodilatory role, very similar to nitric oxide, but we'll cover that in a later video. In any case, now we have biliverdin, either the spleen or the liver. Now the next enzyme is called biliverdin reductase. This utilizes NADPH to reduce biliverdin into something called bilirubin, and you can see the structure of bilirubin right here. Now, if you are the spleen, the last enzyme you have in this pathway is biliverdin reductase. So when biliverdin is converted to bilirubin, the bilirubin is then going to leave the spleen and be transported to the liver. Okay? Uh, this is what we call unconjugated bilirubin, and you'll see why in a minute. It basically doesn't have any additional functional groups attached to it. It is just bilirubin, and it's bound to serum albumin, a protein that allows it to move to the liver. If you are the liver, we also have biliverdin reductase that works in the same way. Biliverdin is simply reduced via NADPH into bilirubin. So if you're the liver, you keep the bilirubin and metabolize it. Further, if you're the spleen, you transport the bilirubin bound to albumin to the liver. So now we have bilirubin here in the liver, and it is unconjugated. This is what it looks like at this point, this third picture at the top. But we're about to conjugate it using an enzyme called UGT1A. There's a lot of UGTs. Uh, the 1A is just a number designation, and it stands for UDP glucuronosyl transferase 1. So these are enzymes that attach glucuronide residues to different molecules. Uh, so for example, here we have no glucuronides in bilirubin, but if you look over here on the far right picture, now we have two. These glucuronides right here are carbohydrate residues that increase the polarity of the molecule. They make it more water soluble. So you can see here, here's one glucuronide, here's a second one, so we need two reactions of this. So the glucuronide donor is UDP glucuronide, so there's two of them required, and they each donate one of those glucuronides. So now we have bilirubin diglucuronide. Okay, that is conjugated bilirubin. So when you see conjugated bilirubin, it just means it's conjugated to two glucuronide residues, bilirubin diglucuronide. Now that bilirubin diglucuronide is more soluble, one very minor fate is it could be moved into the blood and be excreted via the kidneys. This is not the major fate though, of bilirubin diglucuronide. Instead, it's going to move into bile. Let's look at that. So now we have bilirubin diglucuronide, or conjugated bilirubin, that's made in the left lobe of the liver, the right lobe. That bilirubin is going to move through the corresponding hepatic duct, as you can see right here, and ultimately enter the common hepatic duct. 
and then it can be moved up the cystic duct to the gallbladder. So remember, this is where bile is stored, and it can be released into the small intestine when we have a fatty meal. And then once we have a meal and we need to get it into the intestine, the bilirubin diglucuronide moves from the gallbladder down the cystic duct and into the common bile duct, and it's of course going to combine with the juices here from the pancreas via that main pancreatic duct, and ultimately move through the hepatopancreatic ampulla and duct into the small intestine. And so now we have that bilirubin diglucuronide in the small intestine. And then that bilirubin diglucuronide is going to move through the small intestine, through the duodenum, the jejunum, the ileum, and then ultimately into the large intestine, which you see right there. And that's where the majority of the remainder of the reactions actually occur. Now, one thing I want to be very clear about is where I have these reactions drawn, this is not meant to show the location of where the reactions occur. All I'm showing is the order. Okay? It just occurs throughout the large intestine because uh, most of these reactions are actually done by bacteria, the microflora of the colon. Okay? So initially, bilirubin diglucuronide is going to be deconjugated. So remember, it had those glucuronides on it. Those are going to be removed, and they're going to be removed by this enzyme called beta-glucuronidase. Now, humans have this enzyme, so this could be a human enzyme, but bacteria in the colon also have it. So it's bacterial and human that are removing those diglucuronides from bilirubin, and that gets us back to unconjugated bilirubin, and you can see its chemical structure down there at the bottom. Now the remainder of these reactions are either bacterial or they are spontaneous in the presence of oxygen. Okay? So the first reaction is going to convert bilirubin into what we call urobilinogen, and this is just some bacterial reductase that has not yet been identified. Okay? So here is bilirubin right there. The only real difference between bilirubin and urobilinogen is these little double bonds right there, one right there and one there have been reduced to single bonds, as you can see in urobilinogen. Okay? Um, that's done using two molecules of NADPH, most likely by this bacteria, and now we have urobilinogen. Now, if the urobilinogen is to remain in the colon, it can be reduced again by another bacterial reductase into stercobilinogen. You can see that structure right here. Um, basically, uh, urobilinogen is reduced again, probably using more molecules of NADPH. You can see here that these ketones, double bond oxygens, have been reduced to alcohols. There's been a few rearrangements of double bonds, but basically stercobilinogen is a reduced form of urobilinogen. Now the stercobilin in the colon can be oxidized by molecular oxygen, or O2, into stercobilin. Here's stercobilin structure over here. Uh, stercobilin has one extra double bond compared to stercobilinogen, so you know that stercobilin is uh, more oxidized. Now, how does oxygen do this? Where does the oxygen come from? Well, remember that the colon is technically open to the external environment, right? It's got to be in order to eliminate feces. So because it's open through the anus right here, oxygen can get up in here, right? And so there's oxygen present in the colon that can, without an enzyme, oxidize stercobilinogen into stercobilin. Stercobilin emits brown in the visible spectrum, and so it looks brown. It's not responsible for the smell of feces. That we'll be covering in another video. Very interesting, but this is the color of feces. Now back to urobilinogen here. We did say it could remain in the colon and be reduced to stercobilinogen. However, some of that urobilinogen can actually be moved from the colon to the kidney, as you see right here. And something very similar is going to happen to urobilinogen. It can be oxidized by molecular oxygen into urobilin, okay, in the same way that stercobilinogen was oxidized into stercobilin. And again, the kidney is also technically an open system. If you consider the urethra and then the bladder and then here's the ureter, technically this is open to the external environment. Okay, so there's going to be some oxygen in there. And so urobilinogen can be oxidized into urobilin. What's interesting about urobilin? Well, it emits in the yellow region of the visible spectrum. And you could probably guess what that means. Urobilin is what is primarily responsible for the yellow color of urine. And of course, it's going to be eliminated in the urine. Okay. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the degradation of red blood cells and also the degradation of heme and what that means for feces and urine.
Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.